Hello and good afternoon friends, welcome to the CEC Edusit live lecture. Dear friends, as you know that uh, uh, since our uh, previous lectures uh, or I could say since our previous two lectures we are talking on plant physiology. We have conducted uh, two uh, lectures so far on plant physiology and this is the third lecture in the series. Today we are going to talk on nitrogen assimilation in plants and for this we have again with us in our studios Dr. Ashish Kumar Nandi. Dr. Nandi is um, a professor in School of Life Sciences in Jawaharlal Nehru University. So, dear friends, let's take advantages from his experiences and uh, let's try to understand more about uh, nitrogen assimilation in plants. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Edisit lecture. Uh, as far we have conducted two lectures on plant physiology. Uh, if we talk about uh, the term physiology alone, can we say that uh, physiology is the basic uh, structure of the plants or uh, something? Uh, no, not structure. The way how they survive, their biochemical reactions go on, like the process of living uh, is physiology. So like every aspect how it uh, obtain nutrient energy, how it utilizes energy for its function, daily work mm -hmm. and everything is physiology. It is not a structure, structure comes under development. Structure comes uh, under mostly, development, yeah. it is the basic functioning we would basic say. Basic functioning of the plant, so <coughs> maybe today uh, I have already taken two lectures as you said on mineral nutrition. So, <coughs> now uh, for a few lectures we will take specific nutrient. So, what I will tell you today like how plants assimilate nitrogen and as I also spoken earlier that plants are the kind of an unique higher organism which can utilize the elements from the environment like from air, water, soil and convert them into organic matter. So, once this organic matter is converted, then entire other living kingdom like plants, microbes, most of the microbes, plants, higher animals, human being, all we consume on the plant synthesized uh, products. So, uh, basically there are many uh, around 20 different elements are composed together to make organic matter for entire living kingdom. So, that is a process called assimilation. And I have spoken about earlier what are the different elements, their ratios, how they are there in the plant and what will happen if they do not get enough when you add fertilizer and so on. So, today I uh, will specifically speak about nitrogen and uh, there are four different, three different elements which mostly present in the plant I told you earlier is carbon, oxygen and hydrogen. These three are the largest number of uh, molecules present and they are synthesized by photosynthesis. So, uh, when time comes if I have to speak about photosynthesis maybe I will speak about it, but today we are speaking about nitrogen and nitrogen is also very very important for the plant and even every uh, living organism because nitrogen is the major component, not major component, is an essential component in amino acids or building blocks of proteins. So, without proteins no living cell can survive and so without nitrogen no living cell can be survived. But however, the nitrogen which is present in the air like uh, 80 percent nitrogen is almost in air that cannot be used by any living cell unless it is converted into an organic form by a plant. So, we learn by this class and maybe two more classes from now how plants convert this inorganic nitrogen to an organic form. So, also let me tell you one thing over here, uh, there are microbes which can do it in combination with plants mostly. So, I will come and talk about details about that. Okay. So, there are two process what we call as a mineralization where natural elements convert into organic form. However, see the nature has a balance that continuously keep making elemental form from already synthesized form and that process is called mineralization like so, so that the balance of the nature is made. So, one is assimilation and the reverse a conversion of the organic form into inorganic form is called mineralization. So, this is a nitrogen cycle 
so that uh, many of you must have read from the school level onwards. You can see here is NH4. This NH4 is considered as ammonia and this ammonia is kind of a living link between organic form and inorganic forms. So, the process like here is nitrogen, this nitrogen is gaseous form and that is present mostly in the air. And this uh, nitrogen cannot be used until it is converted into ammonia. This ammonia can convert into other forms like nitrous, nitrate, nitric and so on. So, these different forms of nitrogens are all are inorganic form and so is the ammonia is an inorganic form and plants convert into organic form that is what we will learn how they do it and use it for their own benefit as well as benefit of the entire living kingdom. <coughs> this is an overview of nitrogen in biosphere or what you call as nitrogen cycle. This nitrogen is present in the air. So, large number of amount of nitrogen get fixed by thunders during thunderstorm. So, during thunderstorm the temperature reaches very high, the very high temperature this nitrogen can convert into oxides of nitrogen and that oxides of nitrogen can react with water and can precipitate on the soil. So, you get a nitrates and these nitrates microbes can convert into ammonia. This ammonia is also an inorganic form that eventually plants convert them into organic form and that is used by animals and other animals. So, when they die they decay come to the soil and this is the process of mineralization where nitrates or other forms go back to the atmosphere by denitrifying bacteria. Now, if you look into the amount of nitrogen present in the earth crust amount of nitrogen is about 0.1 percent weight by weight. However, in atmosphere you have 80 percent of nitrogen. So, if you normally think that there is lot of nitrogen in the air, but very little in the present in the earth crust that would be wrong. The reason is that these are all weight by weight you can say. See the weight of the atmosphere what we have surrounding the earth is much much low than the weight of the earth crust itself. So, this 0.1 percent nitrogen in the earth crust is much much higher amount than what you see in the atmospheric air. So, on an average almost earth crust has 50 times more nitrogen atom than the atmosphere has. This nitrogen is kind of an unique element that is present in the biological system. One of the very interesting feature what nitrogen has is the presence of nitrogen in a multivalent form. You see here the nitrogen's valency in nitrogen is 0, in N2O is plus 1, NO plus 2, NO2 minus plus 3, NO2 plus 4, NO3 minus plus 5 and NH3 is minus 3, NH4 plus is minus 3. So, valency of nitrogen can range from minus 3 to plus 5 and that way this is a kind of a very unique element and that is maybe one of the reason why it can do diverse biological function being present in the cell. As I told you just beginning that nitrogen is very important, it is present in the amino acids and in fact every amino acids have nitrogen and the amino term is used for the amine group. Like so if you this is the standard structure of an amino acid. So, NH3 C COOH. So, this is the standard amino acid end and it can vary the side chains. So, every amino acid had nitrogen, this is adenine, this 
not only really adenine like many of the most of the biological students would know uh, DNA or RNA the genetic material are composed of nucleotides. Each and every nucleotide has multiple numbers of uh, nitrogen atom. So, you, you can see the structure of adenine there are at least uh, 4 5 uh, nitrogens are there and similarly similar number of nitrogens are there in other uh, nucleotides. This is a nicotine, nicotine is a secondary metabolites and this also presents nitrogen. Plant hormone like zeatin, indole acetic acid, these have nitrogen. Now, look at this molecule is a large molecule here, this molecule is chlorophyll. You see this chlorophyll has at least 4 nitrogen, there are 4 nitrogen in the center of the chlorophyll molecule. So, the biological system have the like building blocks like nit nit proteins have the amine, proteins have nitrogen, hormones have nitrogen and then DNA has nitrogen, RNA has nitrogen, chlorophyll has nitrogen. So, without nitrogen actually plant cannot survive in any aspects of its growth, it is very very important. Now, if you look into the overview of nitrogen uptake and metabolism, you will find that plant can take. So, these are the low, say this is a very schematic diagram. Here, the lower uh, indicates this, this lower parts indicate the root cells, and in between this is a stem, and this is a cell in the leaves or above ground. In the root cell, nitrogen can be obtained by either as a nitrate or as ammonia. So, this nitrate or ammonia are the two forms that plant can absorb and both of them if they are required they will be used, if not they will be sequestered in the vacuole. So, this is you can see here that nitrate can go to the vacuole or it can go to the plastids where nitrate will be used up for making amino acids. This nitrate can be transported, can go up to the upper side of the plants, can again do the same thing like it can go to the vacuole or it can make amino acids. There are some plants which I also will speak today are capable of fixing nitrogen in a symbiotic way with the help of bacteria. So, they make nodules and this in the nodulated root cells, the nodules absorb nitrogen, gaseous nitrogen and convert them into ammonia. So, they do not and this is the one unique case and very potential uh, in the biological system for converting atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia which will further be converted into organic forms and be used by the plants. So, this is a rate of nitrogen fixation by many different ways in our earth. The total amount of nitrogen fixed, here nitrogen fixed means that amount of nitrogen molecular nitrogen converting into other form like nitric oxides or ammonia. This is not actually assimilation, this is nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation means say nitrogen element has a triple bond. So, N triple bond N. So, this triple bond of nitrogen has broken down into a single or double bond and so you have the uh, mostly single bond to have nitric oxides or ammonia. Now, the amount of nitrogen fixation, so that is what I am telling you this is a difference between fixation and assimilation. Fixation is conversion of elementary nitrogen into nitric oxides or ammonia. Now, look at the amount, every year you get almost 10 to 20 tera gram of nitrogen fixed per year by only lightening or thunderstorms and 1 tera gram is 10 to the power 9 kg or you can say it is 1000 billion kg or million million kilogram of nitrogen. So, it is a large amount of nitrogen is fixed by only thunderstorms or lightning 
throughout the year in this earth. Then, but now if this amount will be looking very small, if you think about in the biological in terrestrial systems. So, there are two systems have been here, one is a terrestrial system, one is a marine system. The terrestrial system has a combination of microbial uh, synthesis, bacterial synthesis and symbiotic synthesis. So, there are many of them and this fixes around 90 to 140 teragram of nitrogen per year. Now, look at the biological marine system, this biological marine uh, sorry this is yeah, this is marine system. In the marine system almost entire fixation is by symbiotic fixation and that contributes a huge amount up to 300 teragram per year. And besides that of, at, of, as of now there are many industries which can fix urea like this is essentially a uh, industrial fixation where uh, urea and other nitrogen fertilizers are being made and they are being applied by the farmers in the field. So, that amounts to 80 to 100 teragram per year and to a, a certain extent some amount of elemental nitrogen get converted into acid when we burn fuels or when we just light up the heats up elemental nitrogen gets converts into to a small extent like about 20 teragram per year. So, now if you look into that you will see the biological fixation has the highest amount of fixation including ranging from at least 90 to 300 teragram per year. Now, I will speak about little bit industrial nitrogen fixation this is essentially to tell you how great a plant is. Now, we have I have given the photograph of two great personalities, one is Fritz Haver, one is Karl Bosch. Both of them got Nobel Prize due to their contribution in industrial nitrogen fixation and that is considered as one of the root cause of green revolution in, in the whole world you can say. Because they, their uh, studies have really contributed to generate ammonia from nitrogen. So, this uh, Fritz Haver he invented the chemical reaction in 1909 for making ammonia from nitrogen and that is what still being used today by the urea uh, industry and he got Nobel prize in 1918. Then you have Karl Bosch he introduced a high pressure chemistry to make synthetic methanol so and got Nobel prize in 1931. So, why these two are important is shown in this diagram. Here you can say that methane, water and air, air is having say 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen almost and this air in steam and methane when they are uh, reacted together under 30 to 40 atmospheric pressure it converts into hydrogen gas. So, this hydrogen gas is very very important for reacting with nitrogen and there are some steps to purify to remove the impurities and once this pure hydrogen is made this nitrogen and hydrogen are allowed to react at 400 to 650 degree centigrade and 150 to 140 atmospheric pressure to make ammonia. So, now if you can if you just look into this uh, reaction only no, you can see how much of energy is required just to make the triple bond of nitrogen. So, nitrogen and hydrogen so it is a highly reducing environment all the oxygenated molecules are removed and nitrogen and hydrogen under highly reducing environment this is at the temperature of 600 and above and at the pressure of more than say 400 150 to 400 atmospheric pressure nitrogen converts into ammonia. So, essentially this is a process that takes large amount of energy to convert into nitrogen and ammonia. Now, you see that is only contributes a negligible amount in the total nitrogen fixation in the earth I told you a few minutes back it is hardly about 100 teragram. Now, the large chunk 
is made by the plant. So, it is so amazing to see how be a plant, a living cell can bypass requirement of such high pressure and high temperature to make or uh, to fix nitrogen. So, that is what we will uh, say today. So, essentially you do not need any high end instrument, nothing factors, no pure hydrogen and absolutely in the biological normal atmospheric pressure one can do it. Now, look at this picture here. Here this is the left side you have a pea plant and there are many such plants that can synthesize that can fix nitrogen with the help of bacteria that you even cannot see in naked eye. These kind of plants like nodule, these are leguminous plants and there are many non-leguminous plants that can make symbiosis and form these kind of nodules. These are the factory of biological nitrogen fixation and these are called as nodules. So, same thing what I told you a few minutes back like say uh, nitrogen and hydrogen under very high temperature and pressure the same biochemical reaction takes place in the bacteria when look at a reaction which is written here. So, one molecule of nitrogen converts into ammonia, two molecules of ammonia with the help of 16 ATP, 8 reduction potential and 8 proton. So, 8 reduction potential, 16 ATP for one molecule of nitrogen. So, that is a huge amount of energy again, but this energy is a metabolic energy not a heat energy or it can also be taken under normal atmospheric pressure. And this is carried out by a protein complex which is called as nitrogenase. This nitrogenase is a complex that complex has a lot many, many different proteins that can convert nitrogen into ammonia at the cost of energy. Many I am sure most of you who are listening this talk know what is ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, this is considered as the energy currency of the cell. Plants or any living being use their food to generate ATP, so that this ATP can be used in other biological reactions. So, this ATP generated by metabolic energy is used instead of heat energy that is used by the industry for converting nitrogen into ammonia. So, this uh, there must be something very special in this enzyme complex or in the enzyme nitrogenase or a multiprotein complex, uh, how it can bypass the requirement of such a high level of energy. So, I uh, will try to explain to you and I hope you will be able to understand. If not, I will also tell you that some of the books that can help you to read more, so that you can have a look into it if you find difficulty in understanding what I am going to tell you today. Okay. So, this biological nitrogen fixation contributes 80 to 90 percent of the terrestrial um, system and 100 percent of the marine available nitrogen for the living world. And the reaction I told you one is only available in the prokaryotes. So, what I told you this is a proprietary reaction of only prokaryotes, the nitrogenase enzyme can convert into nitrogen to ammonia, this is a high energy requiring process. Now, coming to that main question what I have told you that how proteins convert into uh, nitrogen to ammonia, what is the living reaction behind. So, here you can see some uh, round structures, each and every round structure represents a protein. So, you can find see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So, there are 6 proteins are present and combined together to form and enzyme complex is a nitrogenase complex. These 6 proteins are grouped into two. One group is here in the same color, this is called 
as dinitrogenase reductase and here you have four proteins which are called as dinitrogenase and these six proteins together converts nitrogen. Actually there are though there are six proteins and the actually there are three types of proteins. This to a same protein, this to a same protein and this to a same protein. So, there are three types of proteins. This is now if I am talking about dinitrogenase, this dinitrogenase have two types of proteins. So, this is also other way called as hetero dimeric protein. So, this is a dimer of two type of proteins and you can see here on the top it is written MOFE that means it is a molybdenum iron binding protein. This is the protein which that actually many of you know there are something called enzyme, one is called holoenzyme, apoenzyme and prosthetic group. So, this is a metal group which is bound with this enzyme to make the holoenzyme and this is a molybdenum iron cofactor and this is the part of enzyme which can convert nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia. But this enzyme can only work when it gets the energy by these two proteins or this protein which is dinitrogenase reductase. This protein can use the energy of ATP and that energy and also it can use the energy of reduction potential from ferredoxin and transfer over this group to, to make ammonia. Now, the same reactions what is there in this protein complex I have simplified in this line here. You see here what I have written. So, nitrogen to ammonia is converted by two enzyme one is called dinitrogenase reductase one is called redu dinitrogenase. So, this dinitrogenase reductase used use reduced ferredoxin. This reduced ferredoxin by is used by the dinitrogen reductase to reduce dinitrogenase and that reduced dinitrogenase now convert nitrogen into ammonia. So, this is what is the biological reaction. Now, to understand how this biological reaction really takes place, we need to understand how the protein is composed of and how these metals are there. Actually, all both of them have metal uh, clusters. There are metals like sulfur, molybdenum, iron and this three different metals makes the metal clusters and these metal clusters binds with the proteins. So, this protein and metal cluster together actually can perform this experiment, experiment I am talking here, yeah, experiment of converting nitrogen to ammonia. So, you will really understand probably if you look into the structure which I am showing in the next slide. Now, you see here, uh, this ribbon like structure, you can see these ribbons are the amino acid ribbons and these are you can tell as dinitrogenase reductase. So, this is the first enzyme, this is the structure and this is the glowing structure over here, this is a iron binding protein and iron sulfur cluster and this is the second protein. Second protein is dinitrogenase, this is a very large protein. So, second protein is 240 kilo Dalton, the first protein is 64 kilo Dalton. In second protein complex again has the four molecules that I have shown by schematic diagram. So, see 1, 2 same protein and 3, 4 same protein. So, there are two metal clusters. The same cluster now is shown over here, this is a little bigger one. Now, look here, this blue and green are the two proteins and this purple and the brown are the two proteins and between the junction of each protein there is a metal cluster. This blue and green are called A protein or alpha proteins, red and purples are called beta proteins or B proteins and the reaction center is yellow or turquoise. This reaction center has two metal clusters, one is called P cluster and one is called iron molybdenum cofactor cluster. 
So, I will show you this kind of a structures which probably will help you to understand. <coughs> Look at this iron molybdenum cofactor. This co is not cobalt, many students may mistake it here. Please note there is no cobalt. <coughs> cobalt is not there in the plant at all as a nutrient. So, this is iron molybdenum cofactor cluster. So, these molecules are <coughs> iron molecules and you have this yellow colors are sulfur clusters. So, here is one clusters on the top, there is one cluster in the down and there are three sulfurs which are considered as sulfur bridge. So, there is a 4 Fe 3 S and one molybdenum 3 Fe 3 S cluster. That means, there are three sulfur molecules, three iron molecules, one molybdenum, this is one cluster and in the top this molybdenum molecule is replaced by another iron molecule in the top line. So, in the top you have 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 4 iron and 1, 2, 3 sulfur. <coughs> so, this is a 4 Fe 3 S and 1 Fe 3 S. <coughs> this is the M cluster. So, uh, maybe I can skip about this, skip that and this is the P cluster which is very, very important. So, this is a P cluster where the enzymes contains one pair of identical P cluster. So, this here actually you can see the same here 1, 2, 3, 3 iron, 4 iron and 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 sulfur and here again 1, 2, 3, 4 iron and 3 alpha alpha. Now, look at the thing what is happening in the P cluster that is probably something going to help you to understand how this is happening. See here, this is a P cluster, this P cluster has on the top you can see there are 4 iron and 4 sulfur. In the down you have 1, 2, 3, 4 iron and 3 sulfur. So, whereas this sulfur is a complete cuboidal, this is semi cuboidal and this is not a perfect cuboidal structure, but this structure is very stable. It is a very stable structure. However, when it get reduced, it can make a unstable transient structure by making a new connection between sulfur and iron over here. So, this is the new, you can see this line here, this is the new line which was absent in the reduced form. So, in the oxidized form, it forms a new bond between this sulfur and the iron and the, because of this uh, new structure, it became unstable and that instability causes the re reactions to go on. So, if you look at the molecular distance now, you see this is the 4 Fe 4 S and now in the reduced form you have 4 Fe 4 S and this is the shared sulfur. Look at here, look at the distance, this molecular distance between any iron sulfur is 2.92 angstrom. However, in 2.2 single angstrom indicating actually this is the one where the newly formed one has 2.26 angstrom and that change in the length is cause a stress and that stress is revealed by transferring electron to the next molecule which is a iron molybdenum cluster. So, this is what happens over here in the dinitrogenase reductase. In the dinitrogenase reductase is an ATP binding protein. So, when there is no ATP, this is the structure and this structure when it binds with the ATP, now you see the structure gets changed. So, when the structure is gets changed, actually it pushes, this is the one where you have a 4 Fe 4 S cluster that I showed you before. So, what happens that this 4 Fe 4 cluster get pushed down towards the P cluster by 4 angstrom and that causes the reduction in the transient energy and that helps to reduce nitrogen into uh, ammonia. So, that is what actually I have tried to explain to you. In case you have find it difficult in understanding, I would suggest that there is a book 
it is called biochemistry and molecular biology of plants that is edited by Buchanan is the serial, uh, senior author over there and that book has quite clearly established and uh, discussed how it works. So, some of the stu advanced student may look for that book and read it for understanding. Now, a quite interesting thing I discuss today is you see this is the nitrogenase enzyme which is doing the most important job in, in this earth about nitrogen fixation. So, that is converting more than uh, 400 teragram of teragram of nitrogen every year. Now, the very interesting aspect of this nitrogenase is it is very sensitive to oxygen. So, in the presence of oxygen the enzyme just does not work, it gets completely shut off. At the same time you can see this nitrogen fixation requires a lot of energy. So, I told you there are 16 molecule of ATP plus 8 reduction potentials are required for converting one molecule of nitrogen. So, again if you look where the ATP comes from, ATP comes from respiration of the food particles and there is another way ATP generates is during photosynthesis. During respiration oxygen is consumed and during photosynthesis oxygen is evolved. So, if you look at the two major pathways how ATP is synthesized in a cell is associated with oxygen either production of oxygen in photosynthesis or consumption of oxygen in respiration. So, any time if a cell has to get ATP then it is going to be associated with oxygen. Now, at the same time this oxygen is very harmful for nitrogenase complex. So, if even a slight amount of oxygen is there, it is going to inhibit the nitrogenase. The main reason is that this reaction has a highly reducive reduction and environment should be completely uh, reductive environment, it cannot be oxidative environment. So, this is very interesting now to see how this reductive environment is maintained for biological nitrogen fixation. So, you can call it like a paradox in nitrogen metabolism is that it is a process where oxygen is compulsory and at the same time it is a process which is inhibited by nitrogen. So, we will learn how different ways uh, this prokaryotes or microbes can get rid of or can bypass that paradox and still make nitrogen and uh, get energy both. So, let us look into that and so this is the paradox I have spoken about it and you will see how this is done and see now this who can fix nitrogen and how much. This is the title I have given, this is from a book called Plant Physiology by Thais and Ziegler and now if you look here you will see that nitrogen fixation is carried out by leguminous plants, legumes with the help of nitrogen fixing symbionts like azorhizobium, bradyrhizobium, photorhizobium, rhizobium and cenorhizobium. Then you have actinorhizal, this is a tree and that actually is a non-leguminous tree and that can associate it with like frankia and can make symbiotic nitrogen fixation. There are other like azola is a water fawn can combine with anabina, sugar cane for example can make symbiosis with acetobacter and miscanthus is another plant can make symbiotic with azospirolium and this combat symbiosis can fix nitrogen. This though 80 percent of the biological nitrogen is fixed by the symbiosis, there are free living bacteria that also can uh, fix it. Something like cyanobacteria, anabina, calothrex, nosdoc and other bacteria like aerobic bacteria, 
Bacillus, Klebsella, Azospirulium, Clostridium, Methanococcus, Chromatium and Rhodospirulum. So, these are the different kind of bacteria that as a free living can synthesize or fix nitrogen and 80 percent of nitrogen is fixed by the plant and microbe together. So, you will see how now this uh, paradox which I have spoken about, the paradox about having energy at the same time avoiding oxygen is solved by both free living bacteria or free living microbe and symbiotic microbe. So, this is an example of cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria or you call as a Bruggen algae, they are free living bacteria, single cellular prokaryote, but they grow in a chain like a, a multi uh, cellular. And quite interestingly, the cells which are shown over here linearly grown, they are dependent on each other nutrient sharing. These are all vegetative cells. Now, you can see that say after few vegetative cells, when they require to fix nitrogen, some of the cells undergo a morphological switch. This morphological switch now is required for nitrogen fixation. And this is a structure which is called as heterocyst. This is the premature, this is the early development and this is the late or matured heterocyst. Look at the structure, this matured heterocyst have very thick wall, which is a kind of a wall that does not allow free air to exchange. And these are the cells which are specialized in nitrogen fixation. So, how do they get ATP from? This is very interesting. So, the interesting is that this heterocyst cells lack photosystem 2. Like this is what I am showing here is probably known to many of you, which is known as photo Z scheme, Z scheme of photosynthesis. This Z scheme is there in many biology book. If you want, again you can read it under photosynthesis chapter. That will tell you how chlorophyll molecules can absorb energy from the sunlight, can get excited and can further for the transfer electron to reduce carbon eventually. So, if we look into the jet scheme again, so look at the jet scheme here uh, in the slides. You see these are the chlorophyll molecules can absorb light and there are two photosystem, one is called photosystem 1. In the photosystem 1, the light which is absorbed by the chlorophyll is used in the electron transport chain to make NADPH. This NADPH is the reduction potential. Now, if you look at the photosystem 2, this photosystem 2, this light energy is used in the electron transport chain for ATP. And in the photosystem 2, the energy is used to oxidize water to evolve oxygen. So, this oxygen evolution takes place in the photosystem 2. Now, what the heterocyst ha has is that, that have no photosystem 2 and it has only photosystem 1. So, when the photosystem 1 is there, it can generate NADPH, the reduction potential. So, that can be used also for making ATP without making oxygen, but efficiency is low. And with the reduced efficiency, these heterocyst molecules can use for nitrogen fixation and their carbon component is provided by the neighboring cells. So, even though they are single cellular, they actually behave like a multicellular where they grow in combination with each other. So, the vegetative cells supply carbon sources to the heterocyst and heterocyst supply nitrogen sources to the vegetative cells. So, you can say this is also a symbiosis within the same organism actually. The basic things remain the same. Okay. Now, other thing, so previously what I told you is the free living bacteria. 
And now I will speak about the symbiotic bacteria, which is symbiosis or in other words you call as a collaboration. This collaboration or symbiosis is very helpful and this is a very, there is a very powerful mechanism to make the conducive environment for nitrogen assimilation and that is what I will tell you today. So, this is a cartoon of a plant and this is a plant for example, can be a tree or can be a leguminous plant which can make symbiosis in the root and this is the symbiotic nodules. So, here there are plant, so this actually is a slight may be a little bit uh, clumsy, but let me explain to you what happens when symbiosis forms. So, the way symbiosis takes place is between a plant and a bacteria. So, these two know that they are helpful for each other. Many plants keep secreting phenolics or their metabolites into the environment. Like there are many plants which secrete root exudates into the soil. There are for many purposes of that. So, one of the purpose is that to attract other living organism. Actually plant cannot survive in isolation. They have associated with large number of uh, microbes. I also spoke to you sometimes in the, my previous class about the mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza helps in uh, phosphorus assimilation that I told and also other nutrients. This for nitrogen it requires prokaryotes uh, like bacteria. So, the phenolics which are secreted by the plant is something like uh, to let the bacteria know that this is a plant which is looking for the bacteria. And the bacteria in the other hand which is growing in the soil have the receptors. The receptors are like antenna. This antenna molecules are there in the surface of bacteria. They always look for those plant secreted chemicals. So, this is a two way communication between plant and the bacteria. Plant secret chemicals, those chemicals are mostly phenolics and there in the books there are list of chemicals are there and like chalcones uh, and other chemicals are there. These chemicals are received by bacteria and once the bacteria is received, this bacteria get attracted and like a chemo attraction and that they all crawl or move towards the root and start growing over there and eventually go inside the host root and make nodule. So, maybe I will briefly tell you uh, how this process takes place. It may be uh, quite interesting to you all. You can see in this uh, diagram which I am uh, showing in the next slide. So, this is the root uh, uh, surface and this is the root here. This root must have secreted some chemicals and these chemicals are helpful in attracting bacteria like this. So, eventually the root cell would grow and this bacteria also would grow here. Once this bacteria start growing, the plant knows that this is something good bacteria. When you see the good bacteria, this plant root actually bends like this. There is something called cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton reorients. The cytoskeleton determines what should be the structure of a cell and the cytoskeleton uh, changes, it bends and after bending it makes a small pocket like this. In the pocket, the bacteria starts growing. This bacteria secretes enzyme, that enzyme can dissolve the cell wall and then eventually bacteria keep growing. Now quite interestingly, this bacteria would grow and grow and grow and go in the whole plant. But while this process of growth actually is elaborated in this slide, you see here. This bacteria is growing and there is something like an infection thread is growing on from cell to cell. 
but quite interestingly this bacteria are not released directly into the plant cytoplasm. This bacteria when it grows it actually move, pushes the plasma membrane of the cell. So, this is the host cell, this is the plasma membrane, this plasma membrane is pushed inside. So, this is original, this is the original position and from this original position this growing matrices push the plasma membrane inside pushes and then what happens like symbiosis, symbiosome forms like many of you know endocytosis. During endocytosis exactly same thing happens that part of the plasma membrane get endocytosed. So, it is like a endocytosis formation and this forms like a organelle called symbiosome. The symbiosome outer layer is composed of the plasma membrane and then you have inside you have something called bacteria growing. This bacteria may be one or two bacteria or a few bacteria in each symbiosome. However, each cell can have hundreds of symbiosome. These are all small organelle. So, they are exactly like a small endocytic vesicles having bacteria inside and that eventually can grow like a symbiosome. There are two morpho different morphologies. This is the bacteria which is growing is a free living before they came in contact of the plant and these are called bacterium, free living bacterium. You see their morphology in contrast to the type of bacteria that undergo symbiosed, they are called bacteroid. This bacterium is active cell division, they divide very rapidly and there is no nitrogen fixation by this bacteria. However, same bacteria when they internalize and go inside the host cells, you see their structure get altered and they do not divide much. So, there is a limited cell division. However, they can carry nitrogen fixation and look at their morphology, they are morphologically also quite different from the free living bacteria. So, now if you look into this figure you can say that in the initiation upon the initiation of symbiosis the plants acquire a new organelle like symbiosome. And not only new organelle you can see now when the symbiosis starts it makes a new organ as well like a nodule. You can see here like this cells even I will also uh, uh, speak to you probably details again uh, sometimes. So, when this bacteria comes and go inside the root cell it starts it initiates cell division in the root. Like uh, as if you uh, recall I have about a minute back I told you the bacteria enters through root hair. Now, this root hair formation takes place at the differentiation zone. So, if you recall the root structure at the down you have a meristematic zone where cell divides, then on the top you have elongation zone where cells only elongate and then there is a differentiation zone on the top of that where root hair forms. At the differentiation zone cells do not divide anymore. So, that is what actually sometimes I have discussed under the developmental biology uh, program, uh, topic uh, class in this uh, forum. Now, the cells which are not dividing at all in the differentiating zone now starts dividing when symbiosome uh, takes place. So, they when the cells get a lot of symbiosome it starts dividing also. So, naturally what happens it gets lot of extra cells and those extra cells starts dividing in many different orientations and it make a ball of cells which are dividing and you can call them like a meristematic cells. And once this meristem this is called nodule meristem. So, when the nodule meristem forms it starts dividing again like any other meristem. 
So, if you recall there are many stems like determinate meristem and indeterminate meristems, where sometimes the meristem completely divides and gets into terminal cells and sometimes meristem remains like a meristem. In case of nodule formation also you get both the types of meristems and these both the types of meristems can form symbiotic nodules both sometimes which will be like continuously growing some stop growing after certain time. So, in the plants you may get sometimes very long like a tubes nodules which keep hanging sometimes very round fixed size nodules in a plant. So, depending on the plant and uh, combinations of between plant and bacteria. So, what I can see the time is almost getting over. So, today what I have told you so far is nitrogen is very important and what are the different ways amount of nitrogen is there and nitrogen is only used when triple bond of nitrogen is broken and it makes nitric oxide and ammonia. So, we have discussed so far the chemical reaction for nitrogen to formation of ammonia and the requirement of energy. So, what I will do is that I will shortly maybe in a few days I will take another class on this topic and I will continue to say how the symbiotic nodule gives you the con environment conducive environment for nitrogen fixation in presence of atmospheric oxygen with a highly reducing environment. So, since time is getting over I will wind up now and uh, maybe if opportunity comes, so I will speak to that in the next class. Okay. With this note, uh, thank you sir, thank you so very much for uh, giving your precious time as well as uh, giving your precious inputs uh, to this uh, very lecture. Dear friends, I hope that uh, you must uh, have grabbed maximum knowledge uh, through this lecture. If you have any queries or if you want to give your feedback regarding this particular lecture, then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate nic.in. We would love to solve your queries next time when uh, Dr. Nandi visits our studio again. With this note, uh, thank you sir, thank yeah. you so much once again. Thank you.